Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Fellowship Bible Church. Welcome to our Bible study here tonight. We're going to be studying uh, Psalm 91 in just a moment. And Psalm 91 is uh, a psalm that makes many great promises that we just need to trust in the Lord and, and just be very grateful and faithful trusting in those promises. And so they're a great blessing to us, right? I thought we would start our fellowship tonight with singing a hymn about that. It's number 271 in your hymn books. It's Standing on the Promises. So let's sing that hymn together. Welcome, everybody. Welcome to those of you who are watching online. Welcome to everybody here. We're going to start our Bible study now with Standing on the Promises. Let's open with a word of prayer. All right, Dan, why don't you open us with a prayer? Father God in heaven, we thank you so much for allowing us to be here of your throne to hear our prayers. Thank you for wanting to call us friends and for salvation. Yeah. You are an awesome, the awesome God. Yeah. And you're all good. You love your your love, your patience. Yeah. Everything about you is yeah. awesome, wonderful. And yeah. thank you for this time for yeah. the Bible study yeah. and, and glorifying your holy name. Yes, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus Christ's lovely and holy name. Amen. 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 Okay, everybody, here we go. Standing on the promises. Let's sing. Here we go. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fail When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord. Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. I tried to turn the mic to face you. I, I noticed on listening to uh, some of these recordings, like on Thursday nights especially, that all you hear is me. And so I don't know if that helped at home to hear like the people that are here singing so you don't just hear me or not. So I'll listen later and we'll find out. Okay, well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. That's awesome, right? And that's, that sets us up perfectly for what we're going to study tonight. Take your Bibles, if you would, everybody, and uh, open up to Psalm 91. Psalm 91. On Thursday nights, uh, going forward for the next few weeks at least, uh, I'm just going to pick psalms. I, just, I read through the psalms all the time. 
and uh, it's just a daily part of my life. It's actually the first thing I do when I wake up in the morning is I sit down and I read a psalm and then go into prayer. And, and uh, you know, they just really, they really do something special in the strengthening of your faith, I believe, because it's, it's less about, like, doctrine and teaching, although it is that, but it's, it's much more just about, like, the cry of the heart of the faithful one. And so the believer, the child of God, there's so many different circumstances that someone might cry out the things that are expressed in the Psalms, circumstances that a person might find themselves in. And, and, and these cries to the Lord, you find yourself reading and, and placing yourself in the position of the psalmist and then when some of the messages, the promises and the, the, the blessings and the comfort or even the rebukes come back, um, you, you're able to just really take them for yourself, which I think is what, is what the Lord wants from us. Amen. I suppose I should preface then this by saying that when you read in the Psalms, you're obviously in the Old Testament, so you're not going to read the name of Jesus and you're not going to read the... The, the presentation of the gospel as clearly as you would say in the gospel of John. I mean, certain Psalms like Psalm 22 and, and some, uh, some of the other ones, sure. But, but um, I just want to preface the whole thing as we study Psalms that these are, these are cries of the heart of people who are children of God by faith and living in the times of the new covenant as we do I can say with all confidence, you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus is the Son of God. Many of these psalms prophetically look ahead, at him, ahead to him. There's a, there's a very interesting and unusual connection to the Lord Jesus in this psalm, which you'll see as we go through it in a moment in the text. And, uh, but the foundation for any relationship with God is not just you see him as someone to cry out to in trouble. We are all, the whole human race in its natural state is in trouble because of sin. And our sinfulness is what alienates us from God. Our sinfulness is why there is so much calamity and trouble in the world today. Our sinfulness is what ultimately assigns us the position of rightfully being under the judgment of God without any hope. However, here's the good news. God's love caused him to give Jesus, his son. Amen. And Jesus came, and when Jesus died on the cross, he received the wrath of God against all of my sin and your sin. He received it. He was the substitute. He was a sacrifice for our sins. He died and he was buried, and on the third day he rose from the dead, which shows the complete power over even death itself that he has. And through faith in him, there is the forgiveness of sins and the promise of everlasting life. And that is not anything that we deserve because of any goodness of our own or any religion or anything like that. It is all because of the grace, just the innate goodness of God, unmerited favor towards man, right? When you have received Christ by faith, then, and only then, really, can you look into the Psalms and read them like in the place of the psalmist and find that relational experience of the things that are expressed in these Psalms. You follow? Mm -hmm. All right? Okay, so with that in mind, just wanted to give you that little thing because I know might have some people watching or maybe even some of you here you need Christ as your savior. That's the foundation of it all. It's not just, I believe God can help me. No, I recognize my sinfulness and my need for deliverance from my own sin. And I need that gift of eternal life. Come to Christ. If you have any questions about that, you reach out to me and I can help you some more, okay? But now let's go into the Psalm. Let me pray for us and then I'll read. Our Father in heaven, most holy Lord God, we thank you, Lord, that, that we can experience and understand some of the, the struggles and, and even some of the great promises that there are 
in a relationship with you and that we have that relationship through Christ and through him alone by your grace. Thank you so much, Lord. Now, as we read this great psalm, I pray, Lord God, we would see these promises that we were just singing about and Lord, that you would strengthen us even in the midst of hardships and a very difficult season to stand on those promises, to trust amen. in you. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Ready? Psalm 91. <coughs> he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night nor of the arrows the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side and 10,000 at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Well, there's a psalm that, you know, if you're reading as part of your devotional life and and you're reading it, you know, in the way that, like, I, I've, I've described for you. Put yourself in the place of the, of the faithful child of God, the psalmist. And there should be great encouragement in all of that, right? Because of those promises of God that are in there. Let's go through uh, some of this a verse at a time. It starts off, the first statement says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, now look at this word, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty, right? So there's kind of an if-then thing going on there. Let me first just draw your attention to the two terms, the two names that are used to describe God there and, and put them together to see what the, the psalmist has in mind, what the psalmist is thinking concerning the Lord. When it speaks of the Most High, you're speaking of you know the, the position of God in relation to anything or anyone else that exists. Right? That is to say, God is a God of all authority over everything and everyone. And then the second name there to describe God is the Almighty. And that's the, that's the Hebrew word Shaddai, and, and combined with uh, the name God, you know, God Almighty, you're probably familiar with the term El Shaddai from different songs maybe you've heard or, or whatever, but that's one of, one of the great titles for God, God Almighty, El Shaddai. Here the word is Shaddai. So you speak of God being Almighty, you speak of what? His power over everything. So you have these two terms, Most High and Shaddai, Almighty. And so God is being described as authoritative over everything else, and powerful over everything else. In other words, God is completely sovereign, and because God is completely sovereign, he is completely worthy that we should what? Trust him. Believe him and trust in him. Amen? Amen. Now, that's for you and that's for me. I'm not just making a theological point about God. These are psalms. This is the, the, the person saying it. This is something that 
needs to be appropriated in your life. And that's where the kind of the if-then comes in. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. In other words, the person who d- d- to dwell somewhere means to live there. The secret place of the Most High. It, the secret place often um, is a reference to kind of the deep inner workings of a man, right? So the person who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, meaning the person who just assigns themselves to that place. Again, we're speaking of people who are believers, right? So as a believer, you devote yourself completely to just your faith in God and just staying right there before the Lord, right? Then what? Shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And that's a reference to God's overarching protection for your life. In other words, as I as I devote myself, like, and the New Testament for Christians is filled with commands. The most famous one probably I share all the time is to set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. You remember that from Colossians, right? You know, the more, the more that you just sanctify and, and devote yourself wholly to the Lord and set your mind in the right place, set your mind on things above, the promise that is given is that you shall abide under his shadow. Later, it refers to the shadow of his wings, right? So pro- protection is promised to the person who trusts in the Lord and stays with him, right? Look, it's not just knowing it and saying, amen, hallelujah. It's being a doer of it, right? Amen. It's the appropriation of it in your life, you know? There are so many things that, we can allow to creep into our minds through listening to it or looking at it or, or going there, participating in it. There's so many things that if we're honest and just kind of take that spiritual inventory of our own lives, there are things that can take our minds and our hearts away from that, that devoted relationship with God. There are things that can kind of reach into that secret place and kind of lure us out and pull us out, right? And, and you know, what you want to do in your life is just stay there, man. Stay close to the Lord. Set your mind on things above again, like Colossians says. Look what it says here then in the second part of this in verse two. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Look at the words just in those first two verses. It speaks of dwelling. It speaks of abiding. It speaks of God being a refuge. It speaks of God being a fortress, right? You get the, the, the picture that he's describing is like you're, you're in God and there's like a security from whatever else is around because you're in him, a dwelling place, an abiding place, a fortress, a refuge. That's, that's, that's El Shaddai. That's the Most High, right? Praise the Lord. But I want to focus also on this statement, the beginning of verse 2, I will say of the Lord. And you know, you've seen him, we saw him in verse 1, Most High, El Shaddai. Here he's described as, by his name, Yahweh, Lord, which separates him from anything or anyone else that people might erroneously think of as being God. Yahweh, the only one, right? I will say of the Lord, there is that, there is that determination of the faithful one. There is that statement of the faithful one. There is that commitment of the faithful one. There is that faith declaration, if you will, that confession. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and him I will trust. I'm not just going to go and like, and like walk around in my own way and just, you know, I know that God is sovereign. And you, what, you, what you do here is you see, kind of a, you see kind of a relationship between the sovereignty of God and the, the deliberate, intentional commitment of man, right? It's not just, I know God is sovereign, and so I'm just going to do whatever I want and whatever, whatever I happen to be doing, that must have been God's will for me to do. No, here's the psalmist saying, I will say of the Lord. He's making a declaration, right? So make sure you understand that, right? We know who God is. Now you make that commitment to him. Make a commitment as a child of God 
Make a commitment to the Lord. And then verse 3 launches into this list of promises and blessings that are associated with making that dedicated relational commitment to him. Look at verse 3. Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. What's a fowler? A fowler is someone who traps fowl for food. So it speaks of life being filled with traps. There are traps in the lust of our flesh. There are traps from Satan and the principalities and powers that he rules over. There are all sorts of things that can, can snare us. Well, we're told here that if we say of the Lord, he's my refuge and fortress, we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, what? There were promised deliverance from that. And from the perilous pestilence, right? Some people might look even at the circumstance the world is in now, right? And say, and say that uh, there's some relevance to that, right? There's a deliverance. God promises protection, right? Does that mean, well, I'll come back to the whole idea of the, the idea of general, general truth versus the sovereignty of God allowing testing and struggle in our lives for purposes. We'll come back to that in a little bit because that definitely comes into play later. But generally speaking, obviously we're looking here at these great promises and great truths. We're promised deliverance. It says he shall cover you with his feathers. So there's a, there, that, that covering of like the wings um, speaks of like great protection. Under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. And the word buckler is kind of like a, a smaller shield that might be carried in combat. Like you might think of an ancient soldier as having like a really giant shield that he might have to sheath his sword and carry this giant shield. And, and maybe you've seen this depicted in movies, whatever. The soldiers might line up and form a wall with these giant shields. But then when they come out from behind them and draw their swords, they might have a smaller shield in, the, in their arm that they might fend off and, you know, so the idea is God is both of those things. He's your shield and your buckler, all right? He's, he's, and that speaks of what? It speaks of his truth being that. So we're promised that the truth of God will be shield and protection from error and things that can cause us to go astray. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night and then all these other things, what? Nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noonday. What does it say there? No fear. When we make God our refuge, when we make God most high, our dwelling place, he promises freedom from fear. We are not gripped by fear because my refuge <laughs> is the creator of the universe. My refuge is the one and only true living God. My refuge is my redeemer and savior. My refuge is God himself. And so I have no need to fear anything. Can do bad things, hard things, difficult things, even tragic things happen to people who are Christians? Sure they do. I mean, you look, I mean, Jesus himself was crucified because that was God's purpose for him. The prophets, many of them were murdered. The apostles, many of them were murdered. Would we say that God failed to protect them? No, because the other, the other thing that you have to like apply to your understanding of these promises is that whenever you speak, listen very carefully to this, Christian. Whenever you speak of things like deliverance and protection and being saved from death, you can't just look at it from the perspective of physical life here and now. Because everybody dies physically, right? There is, there is, a, there is a protection that is absolute and 100% that transcends this temporary existence that we're in, right? Jesus spelled it out in John 11 when he was at Lazarus' funeral, when he said, he who lives and believes in me will never die. And then in the same statement, he said, though he may die, yet he shall live. 
right? So we never die, but physically we die. But who we are spiritually, when we have salvation from God through Jesus Christ, the ultimate expression, the ultimate experience of these things listed here, deliverance, protection, a shielding truth, uh, freedom from fear, the ultimate understanding and experience of these promises is wrapped up in what? Salvation, the promise of God in Jesus Christ. And I told you we would come back to that. Well, 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 obviously the experience of these things is very much, generally speaking, experienced in walking through life as well. We do know that as we walk through life, sometimes Christians give their lives for the faith and sometimes, sometimes even sicknesses, you know, the Apostle Paul spoke of leaving one of his fellow ministry partners, a guy named Trophimus in a city named Miletus. He was sick, and so Paul had to leave him there and continue traveling. It wasn't because there was anything weak about his faith. God was allowing him to be tested. But in the end, the per in the end, folks, the person who has faith in the Lord Jesus Christ needs fearing nothing in this life because this life is a vapor, this life is temporary, this life is short. When this is over, and it's going to be over for all of us, when this is over, we are promised, man, deliverance. We are promised even to throw off the, the shackles of these corrupt mortal bodies, and we're going to put on incorruption and put on immortality, and we're going to live with the Lord forever and worship and serve him, right? We understand as Christians things like deliverance and protection and shielding truth and freedom from fear to apply not just to what's going to happen in my life tomorrow, but to my status before God for all of eternity. And doesn't that give you a greater comfort as a child of God, one who knows Christ? Doesn't that give you a greater comfort than troubles of day-by-day -day life. Not that God doesn't care about those things because I think these promises can apply there as well. But the ultimate understanding and expression of God's promises, man, they transcend this life. Someone who experiences healing, someone who experiences deliverance from something in life, someone who experiences blessing in this life, they still die. But if they know Christ, who they really are, never dies, and what's left behind here, man, it's all just temporary. That's why you set your affections on things above because there's where your real life is anyway. Mm -hmm. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Isn't that where peace, security in the heart, stability in the heart, hope, mm -hmm. isn't, where, isn't that where those things come from? Do you really look for hope in anything in this life? I, I, it's easy to say that and then you say, nope, definitely I don't. But practically speaking, why do you look for like hope and, and relief and, and comfort from any situation or circumstance in this life? We have Christ. We are promised deliverance for all eternity. Now, verses 7 and 8. A thousand may fall at your side and ten thousand at your right hand, but it won't come near you. What does that remind you of? Anything else in the Bible? Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. When I read that, the first place my mind goes is the, the Exodus story and the story of the plagues, right? And how, I mean, the Israelites lived in Goshen and there were Egyptians that lived there as well. And uh, when God sent these plagues uh, into the land of Egypt, I mean, why didn't they affect the Israelites as well? Well, they didn't. Even the animals that belonged to the Israelites were not affected in those plagues. I mean, it's incredible. Even the water was not affected. Even the air they breathed, nothing. And of course, the ultimate of them was the slaying of the firstborn and, and the first Passover, right? It did, and it says in the book of Exodus, it says that God knows how to make the difference. God knows how to, God knows those who are his and God knows how to bless and protect and secure and keep those who are his. Should that not give you comfort as a child of God? If a thousand fall at your side and 10,000 on your right hand, it won't come near you. 
Your eyes will look and you'll see the reward for the wicked. But if you're in Christ, man, deliverance is yours. Jesus accomplished it when he died on the cross. And again, I'm not just talking about in-life temporal stuff. We're talking about for eternity, which is where our minds and hearts are supposed to be set. Amen? Amen. What a great psalm this is, right? Then, verses 9 through 13, he brings up something very interesting that a lot of people ask questions about, and you don't always... uh, You don't always see a ton of things in the Bible written about this, but this is pretty clear. Because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. Most of that is a restatement of things we've seen already. But then it adds this in verse 11. For he shall give his angels charge over you. So now we see here God describing a method by which he provides this protection for his children. And what is it? It's angelic, angelic protection. He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands, they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent you shall trample underfoot. Now, two things about this. Number one, This is a great and precious promise of the Lord, right? And this promise that the Lord has made is one that you should receive and believe and trust in him, right? God has promised that his angels have charge over those who have trusted in him and made him their dwelling place and their refuge. Now, on the other hand, and I know you know this, but I'm going to ask it anyway, uh, who in the New Testament is recorded as quoting this psalm? Not Jesus. Satan. Not, not, yeah, right? Satan in talking to Jesus, right? When he was tempted. It's recorded in both the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. When, when Satan was tempting Jesus in the wilderness, there is that story where he, it says he sets Jesus on the pinnacle of the temple and says, throw yourself down because he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. Now, how did Jesus respond to that? Did he throw himself off the temple? No, of course he didn't. And, and I'll explain in a minute that I don't, I don't think Satan actually believed that Jesus would throw himself off the temple. But what he did was he rebuked him and told him, you don't test God like that, right? You don't, in other words, in other words, the promise of God's protection is not licensed to be unwise or foolish. While we are called to a life of faithfulness, we are also called to a life of righteousness, and we are called to a life of humility, and we are called to a life of wisdom, right? So we need to be people who are faithful and trust God, but we also need to be wise, and we also need to be humble, and we also need to be righteous. And Jesus throwing himself off the pinnacle of the temple would have been none of those things, right? And he recognized it, and so he rebuked Satan, right? Now, I don't think Satan actually believed that Jesus would just take, just foolishly take this promise and throw throw himself off the temple. But what was Satan doing? Satan was doing, then, what Satan still does today, causing trouble, stirring up trouble, with his mouth, right? And planting thoughts. The real danger of that is this tempting of God and testing of God is like, you know, again, and this is where I get back to like pointing out that these are statements of general truth and they should also be viewed as statements that have eternal implications and not just in life. If the person looks at this with a mindset that says, well, this is absolutely true for every single thing in my life and therefore I could just do whatever I want. I can be foolish about how I live and just do whatever I want. No trouble is ever going to happen to me. Listen, you are testing God when you do that and it's not right for people to test God. Certainly not Christians who trust in his grace. But what this can do, what Satan did when he quoted this to Jesus was it could have stirred up doubt it could have stirred up questioning. It could have stirred up a, you know, yeah, 
you know, and, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe he's got a point here, you know. And listen, people do this to each other all the time. You know, they find some statement that somebody says, they, says and they grab it and they try to like make some absolute thing out of it to try to pin each other down. You see people argue about things online where they do this stuff all the time. Like, look, we need to be people who like use our heads because our heads are also a part of what God sanctifies, right? We're supposed to be not conformed to this world any longer, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. So be smart. In addition to being faithful and experiencing the blessing of God, which is what this psalm calls us to, remember, we're also called to be wise, obedient, righteous, humble. Right? Amen? Good. Let me look at verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Does that mean I should go out, you know, and go into the jungle and try to stalk lions to see if to see if they'll get me or should i go looking for cobras that i may try to jump on them to see if there's a no no that, that's not the point right and not that's not how we're called to live what we're told is that generally speaking listen god his angels protect us and are watching over us all right but sometimes god also allows us to be tested right would you say that god failed with job when Job like fell into some of the calamities that he fell into, right? Would you say that God failed there? I wouldn't say that God failed there. I, God had a higher purpose. Remember how this starts. This starts with making this tremendous statement about the sovereignty of God. See, we're not called only to trust God when everything is going great. Amen. You have reached a certain degree of maturity as a Christian when you can look at these promises and see perhaps the longer term spiritual benefit of them in your life and say amen even when circumstances in life may have sickness or danger or, or things like that that are common to man. See, the Lord did not save us just so we can be different kind of people in this world. The Lord saved us and set us apart so we can be citizens of another kingdom altogether, one that is not of this world. Hallelujah. You understand? When you approach these things with that mindset, that is when you have really begun to grow, I think, and experience the depth of a walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 14 through 16, grammatically, what changes? It, it, verses 14, 15, and 16 seem now to be speaking from the perspective of God himself. Whereas verses 1 through 13 were the expression of the psalmist. Now, here's what the psalmist says. God says in response to all of this. 14, because he has set his love upon me. In other words, because he, that is the faithful child of God, has set his love upon me, that's God most high, God the Almighty, Yahweh the Lord. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high. Isn't that awesome? God most high will set on high those who trust in him, which has benefit in life according to the sovereign plan of God, but regardless of what God allows for us to go through in this life, it has absolute eternal benefit and blessing, which is we will be with him. God most high says that he will set the one who loves him on high. It puts us where he is. You get it? What a great promise that is. Because he has set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's known my name. Hallelujah. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him, right? You remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in that uh, furnace, right? And, and you remember, I, I love quoting this, is this recorded in the book of Daniel. You know, they were told to like bow before this great, statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made in honor of himself and they uh, said no we're not going to do that and then he's going to threaten them by saying we're going to throw you into this furnace and 
And they said, basically, look, our God is able to deliver us, and what? And even if he doesn't, I'm still not going to bow before your statue. Amen. Right? In other words, they understood that walking out of that furnace was entirely possible if it was God's will. Being burned to a crisp was also entirely possible if it was God's will. But even if that had happened, God still would have delivered them because they would be then where he is forever with him. Regardless of the outcome of the circumstances of this life, the victory is won in Christ. That's why the Apostle Paul, when in prison, wrote to the Philippians and said, I don't know which is better, for me to remain or for me to go to be where he is. If I remain, I can be a blessing and benefit to you. If I go to where he is, I get to be in him. To me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I live, I can live for the service of the Messiah, but if I die, it's actually gain because I get to go to be with him. God is our deliverer, irrespective of the outcomes of various circumstances in life. See that? He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him what? My salvation, right? So with long life, I will satisfy him. There is an in-life implication for that, right? Again, the general truth here and throughout the Bible, Proverbs as well, is you walk in righteousness, you avoid trouble. Generally speaking, that leads to a more stable and fruitful and productive life here as well. But the ultimate expression and understanding of long life is what? What does it say? I will show him my salvation, right? God blesses with eternal salvation those who trust in him. Look at these promises. Protection, deliverance, shielding truth, freedom from fear, the ability to single you out among the masses, angelic protection, God's own promise of eternal salvation. Things in the world, brothers and sisters, may get very bad. Well, they will get very bad. They already are, and they will get even worse. I guess what I'm saying is, in America, we haven't always experienced the hardest of what persecution as a Christian can be. We may be headed for that. The question for Christians is, are you ready to stand on his promises? The job of preaching God's word in churches is not just to make people feel this or that, or even just to inform them. It is to prepare them to stand in the day of trouble. Are you ready to stand if a government says you can't preach that Jesus is the only way of salvation anymore? Are you ready to stand if laws say you can't call this sin or call that sin? Are you ready to stand if not just through government, but even just from the ranks of society, people begin to take attacks or shots at Christians? Are you ready to stand in the face of persecution. It is the promises of God and not just promises of things that are in this life. It is the promises of God and their eternal blessings and benefits that ought to cause us to be able to stand strongly. Do not put your trust in anything in this life that is strictly of this world. Put your trust as a Christian in the Most High in El Shaddai, in the name of Jesus. Let's close with a word of prayer. Antonio back there, would you close us with prayer?
continue to build us up. We thank you and we pray in your name. Amen. 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 All right. Praise the Lord. There you go. Psalm 91. Beautiful psalm, right? We'll come back next Thursday night and we'll be studying another psalm. And that's what we're going to do on Thursday nights for a little while. So I hope, hope this will be a great blessing for you. I know it'll be for me. Um, next time that we will be online is Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. So we'll have our service here. If you're coming in person, uh, here's an example of needing to be wise, right? Um, you can, everyone is talking about, and it's true that the number of cases of COVID is like starting to go up again, including in New Jersey, including right here in Woodbridge. So we need to be like extra careful about like how we are around here. So make sure if you're coming on Sunday morning, you let me know. I've got to really watch, you know, we were just like starting to get to the point where we were getting people and stashing people in this room and that room, trying to do our best. We need to be careful about our number. Okay. So. Make sure you get in touch with me and, and let me know uh, if you're going to be like at a service on Sunday. That's not said to discourage you from coming. I want you to come, but please let me know well in advance, okay? And uh, so Sunday morning, we'll be here at 10 o'clock to worship the Lord, and we will also be online at 10 o'clock, and you can join us as well. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you for joining us online. Let's all say goodnight to our friends online. Ready? Good night, everybody. God bless you. Good night. Bye-bye. <laughs>